Uh, thank you. There's two things that go without saying tonight, um, so I'm going to say them. Uh, the first is that the National Coalition Against Censorship does vital and important work. And really put your cards in the bowls, guys. And when you're away from here, I know we've got one night. We, we know we're supporting NCAC tonight. But let's really be consistent about it. Let's think about it when we're not here. Because an organization like NCAC is important. The defense not just of the First Amendment, not just of freedom of speech, but of the very existence of the theater. Because the theater is the most democratic medium. In the last decade of the sixth century in Athens, BC, the theater and democracy were both born together at the same time. And there's a lot of things I have said about that, but I'm gonna just limit myself to one. What the theater assumes is that the truth is to be found in the dialogue between opposing points of view. That's the basic aesthetic principle of the theater. Conflict, dialogue, reveals truth. That means that nobody is the actual possessor of the truth. And if you don't believe that the truth comes from the conflict of different voices, different points of view, you don't really believe in democracy. You're using democracy as a cover to put forward your values. In order to believe in democracy, you have to believe that those different points of view conf conflicting produces a greater truth. It's why the theater and democracy were born together. The theater supports democracy, democracy supports the theater. David made reference to my production of Julius Caesar. Thank you. <laughs> David made reference to that production. And first of all, I have to say, it, it is uh, 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 just embarrassing to hear myself referred to as courageous. I'm not courageous. What, um, I mean, I'm a progressive in Manhattan doing the arts. I'm not that, <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> daily take my life in my hands. Um, but what I do do is I support a theater full of artists who are probing the outer limits of how to tell the truth about what is going on in our society. And when there was a big uproar, when we had protesters at the theater trying to stop our show at Julius Caesar, I got out on stage and asked people to videotape me on their phones, and I made a really beautiful speech about our values and what we stood for. And I swear to God, everybody who listens to WNYC thought I was just great. <laughs> and everybody who had been watching Fox and Friends talk about Julius Caesar every day for two weeks didn't even know I'd made a speech. Didn't even know who I was. Made no opinion. When we did Julius Caesar at the Shakespeare Festival and outrage boiled from the alt-right and other places, Shakespeare festivals across the country got death threats because people didn't know the difference between the New York Shakespeare Festival and any other Shakespeare Festival. The problem that we have is not just a problem of free speech. It's a problem of who we're talking to and who we're listening to. And this was really made apparent to me when we had our little to-do at Hamilton when Vice President-elect Pence came to uh, see Hamilton. And you guys will remember that we made a statement from the stage, a very respectful statement, I thought, and um, you know, in defense of Vice President-elect Pence, he stood in the outer lobby and listened to the whole thing. And he actually said to his son when he was booed, that's the sound of democracy, son. However, the president-elect wasn't quite so temperate and insisted on apologies from me and other people. And in response to that, there was an online boycott of Hamilton. And about 200,000 people signed up to boycott Hamilton within a couple of days. Right. I looked at that list, <laughs> and I thought, there's something wrong with this picture. None of these people were ever going to see Hamilton. It was never coming to a city near them. If it did, they couldn't afford the tickets. And if they could afford the tickets, they didn't have the connections to get them. They weren't boycotting us. We've been boycotting them for a long time. If you look at the red and blue electoral map of the United States, and if, I, if you said to me, oh, this is a map of the nonprofit theaters in the United States. The blue is where there are nonprofit theaters, and the red is where there isn't, you would be accurate. The culture, just like the economy, 
just like technology, just like the education system, has turned its back on half the country. And we haven't taken responsibility for doing so. We've actually blamed them for not supporting us. They don't support the theater, fine, we'll go where they do support the theater. And, we've loved, and that's what prompted that sweat tour, where we went to 18 counties that had voted for Obama in 12 and Trump in 16, and just tried to talk and to listen. So I just urge all of us, as we are defending free speech, as we must, we also need to be thinking about who we're listening to. We also need to be thinking about how we deliver our free speech to the people who need it most. And we need to do that both out of morality, out of respect for democracy, and out of self-preservation. Because two years ago, we saw what happened when a whole lot of people who didn't feel in dialogue with us took a revenge on us for that. So while we absolutely have to defend our right for free speech, we also have to figure out how to defend everybody's right and make sure we create forums where we are actually talking and listening to each other. I thank this organization for this award, which I'm terribly grateful.